823 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. The report aims to highlight the problem of obesity and overweight in children, particularly children under five. We're living in environments where there are more and more processed foods. These processed foods are cheaper in many cases than healthier alternatives. We have aggressive uh, and sophisticated marketing techniques, particularly towards children, uh, to, uh, to increase consumption of these energy dense, high fat, high sugar foods, um, as well as we we have an environment where people have insufficient information to make food choices. A young child who is obese um, finds it very difficult. Frequently they don't access the weight management services that they need. They could be bullied at school um, and frequently uh, children who are overweight become overweight and continue to be overweight and obese during an adolescence and adulthood. And this has very serious health consequences. We see that um, these kind of consequences Consequences could include increased cardiovascular disease, increased heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, uh, as well as some cancers, as well as um, uh, uh, joint degenerative joint diseases. So the, the health consequences are very, very severe. So childhood obesity is one of the most serious public health challenges of the 21st century. The prevalence is increasing at an alarming rate. Now almost half of all overweight children under the age of five in the world live in Asia and about a quarter live in Africa. Now the problem with overweight and obesity in children is that you know they're likely to stay obese into adulthood with a greater likelihood of developing non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and heart diseases. The good news however is that the problem of overweight and obesity is largely preventable. So as we get into the new year what role can you play in preventing childhood obesity? Well this is the focus of our discussion today. And joining me in this discussion is an expert panel consisting of a child and adolescent psychiatrist, a dietitian, and a health advisor from Save the Children Essay. So sit back and learn from this exciting show ahead. You can tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. I'm Dr. Silla Mataung and this is Health Talk. Childhood overweight and obesity is a problem globally, not only in South Africa. The World Health Organization reported that between 1990 and 2013, childhood overweight and obesity stats more than doubled. In South Africa, the stats are also quite alarming. It's in a recent national survey, it was reported that one in five boys and one in four girls is overweight or obese. South Africa has what we would call an obesogenic environment, which means that there are many factors contributing to childhood overweight and obesity. For example, there has been a history of poverty and a lack of education around health, and that coupled with an increased urbanization, a more sedentary lifestyle, and more exposure to things like the advertising of junky food stuffs and availability of those food stuffs for children to purchase daily, all of those factors together mean that children are more vulnerable to being overweight or obese. My name is Jacqueline Rus. I'm married with two kids. Jody is 14 and Zia is turning seven years old. For Zia that goes to primary school, I normally pack her two slices of bread. She likes cheese, she likes bologna. And then Jody's different, Jody's at high school. So she wants money to go to the tuck shop to buy chips. She does not want to take sandwiches. I usually eat from the tuck shops. In the morning I normally buy my sweets and then intervals I buy my chips. Sometimes I drink sodas and fizzy drinks. She wants to go to the tuck shop together with her friends at intervals and buy the chips and buy the physical drinks and things like that. It's, it's cheap enough and it's affordable for them to buy. Tuck shop versus lunchbox, it very much depends on the tuck shop. So if the tuck shop is extremely well managed and the school is great about ensuring that there are healthy options there and that the unhealthy options are actually absent, then the children can make 
choices around various healthy options. Children are going to buy sweets and chips if those are available and they have money to go to the tuck shop because they taste nice. So if those options are there, the children will buy them. If they're not there, then children will buy other things. I do think kids have more access to fizzy drinks and sodas and chocolates and sweets because it's available to them at school. Even on their way to school, the tuck shops is open, so even if the school doesn't have one, they can get one on the way to school. So I, I do think that even if the parents put in a healthy snack, rather not give them spending money because they're going to end up buying sweet things that they should not even do. Well, the awareness that we have now is that if obesity rates continue to increase as they are now, there will be about 3.91 million children who are overweight or obese by 2025. So if we don't intervene now on all levels, so individually in our homes and as a government and as schools, then we will have an increasing problem as these children grow up and as more children are coming through the system. All right, so overweight and obesity impacts on a child's quality of life, including physical, psychological, and health consequences, of, as we've just had. Now, to learn more about this problem, it's a great pleasure to welcome into our studio. First up is Dr. Wendy Duncan. Now, Dr. Wendy Duncan is a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and uh, she's based at the Oxford Healthcare Center in Saxonwold. And I might as well just add that you know, she is president-elect of the South African Association of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Thank Duncan. You. All right, and next to her is another perhaps usual face to some that <laughs> may know her. She's been on our show one or two times before, Ria Katsikas. Now, Ria is a, a clinical dietitian and nutritional consultant, and she's also founding partner of Nutritional Solutions, and is based also in Centre, correct? Yes. Welcome to Health Talk once again. Thank you for having me. All right, and then last but not least is another special guest, Sue Jones. Sue is the Health and Nutrition Program Manager at Save the Children South Africa. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you very much. All right, ladies, let's now talk about this issue of childhood obesity, overweight and obesity. Perhaps let's start by the basics. What are we talking about? You know, for adults, it's very easy, you know, but for children, what exactly are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the accumulation of abnormal or excessive weight, fat, yeah. uh, in children to, to such an extent that it impacts on the health and well-being of the child. Right. From a numerical perspective, we use the measures of the so-called body mass index, which is a ratio of weight to height. Mm -hmm. And these are plotted in accordance to the child's age and gender, because mm -hmm. bearing in mind the children are growing and developing uh, constantly. And typically we would say uh, a body mass index beyond the 95th percentile or beyond 95% of what other children for that age and gender mm -hmm. are presenting with. So, so obviously for adults, it's, I mean, it's a simple calculation to mm -hmm. make, mm -hmm. but for children perhaps a bit more difficult. So, so for, for you know, parents watching this show, I mean, you know, if you track uh, your child from mm. birth right mm. through mm. to adolescence, mm. um, what's the best way to do that? One can start from birth um, by clinic visits, okay. and I think many parents do start with the clinic visits right. and the road to health chart okay. on which the nurse will plot the, the child's length, the child's weight. and. Okay. Uh, so it's from that road to health chart that you can see whether the child is normal. That's in terms where of we the start, weight. absolutely. Right. And then later on, it gets a bit more difficult because we have uh, growth charts available to us, but these are not necessarily charts that are normed for African children. Mm -hmm. They're charts that are normed for American children, mm -hmm. uh, and quite commonly we use the CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control's charts. Yeah. And then we can plot the body mass index of the child. Um, okay. and, well, and this would give us an indication. Okay, let's get a perspective from Save the Children South Africa. Now, Sue, how big is this? You know, in my introduction I said a quarter of all overweight mm. children under the age of five live in Africa, which is mm. quite alarming. Mm. Um, what is the extent of this problem in South Africa? In South Africa, there are approximately about eight, 18 million children. And we're looking at 
up to about 20% of those being overweight. Mm. Now, if you look at the age range between two to five, then you are looking at about 20%. If you're looking at slightly older children up to the age of 10, we're still looking at 17 to 20%. Once they reach adolescent period, up to the age of 15 is really where I have the data from, mm. then we're looking at children, girls being more overweight than boys. So girls being approximately 15% overweight in that age range and boys being approximately 7 to 8%. So you are finding it in adolescence more girls being overweight mm. than boys. Mm. So if you look at the total number of children in South Africa, we are now, as, as one of the presenters was saying earlier, looking towards there being... You know, almost three to four million children being overweight by, you know, 2020. It's quite, quite alarming. Mm. Ria, I mean, obviously you, you deal a lot with parents that I would imagine come to you yes. for advice in terms of, uh, you know, uh, their children being a bit overweight or obese. Um, what, what are the trends that you're seeing in your practice? Um, you know, children obesity is actually... A family problem. Mm -hmm. It is not the child per se that should be put on a diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the research shows us is that often the mothers are also overweight. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so it is the family that need to start making healthier choices in terms of the types of food the family eats. Yeah. Um, the times, you know, often you find there's very little structure, there's continuous snacking, yeah. Meal times get neglected. Right. We, we, we're going to come to yeah. that so just now. But so what, what you're essentially saying is that to the family yeah. and all siblings, you know, right. mothers often say, "But my other child is 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 thin." And what we need to realize is that all children should eat healthy, yeah. mm. independent of weight. Yeah. So um, it's education in terms of the whole family that need to start eating healthier. Okay. So so what I pick up from what you're saying is that. You see children that are brought to you for advice being brought by actually overweight parents Absolutely. and other siblings. Absolutely. Why should we worry about this? What is, what is the consequences of a child being overweight and obese? Well, as your insert uh, showed us, the, the consequences are quite far-reaching, mm. starting with physical consequences, which have impacts in childhood, uh, impact from a, an emotional perspective, a physical perspective. Um, they also have an impact in childhood from a social perspective. Mm. So the physical consequences which can endure into adulthood mm. and then from my perspective obviously the emotional impact mm. and the burden of low self-esteem, lack of con uh, confidence mm. and impact educationally right. because these young folks may well develop very severe sleep disorders, yeah. which are then going to impact on daytime functioning, capacity to focus, participate in the learning environment, mm. and partake in their world yeah. um, on a day-to-day -day basis. In the insert that we played earlier, there was reference to, you know, these children being bullied at school mm. because, you know, they mm. seen as being abnormal and, and, and that sort of thing. Mm. So that's really what you're talking to in terms of, uh, you know, emotional... Um, Affect, isn't that so? Uh, absolutely. So bullying is, is a huge problem mm. for these children. What's also interesting is they may then turn uh, the situation around and become bullies themselves. Right, right. Either way, they're ending up socially uh, ostracized and emotionally mm. worse off yeah. because of the obesity. Globally, what, what impact are you seeing? I'll, I'll come... I'll or Maybe perhaps let's start with theory. Add yeah. from, yeah. A fun, from a physical point of view, they've done a study in the UK. They called it, they called it the early bird study. Yeah. And we always think, you know, <coughs> blood pressure and cardiovascular disease only happen later in life. Mm -hmm. What they actually found with that particular study was that the, these obese children had already high blood pressure, already impaired glucose tolerance. So mm -hmm. that means that the pancreas was, was had difficulty to metabolized glucose, right. and cardiovascular lesions. And that was uh, done with children between about 9 and 12 years old. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe at this point, I know that I've asked you, you know, what your, 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 mm. your view is, but, mm. but perhaps we'll do that just after the break. Okay, it's time for a quick commercial break. After the break, we now focus on causes and risk factors. Please stay with us.
Shield, embracing our members in good health since 1968. It's so good, nothing else can replace just your slightest embrace. And if you only would be my own for the rest of my day. I will whisper this phrase, my darling Ceci Pong. If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. Africa remains in the grip of a dry spell. It's led to water restrictions imposed across the country. About 20,000 cubic centimeters are being released per second. Authorities say that it could take 10 days. In the meantime, they're appealing to residents to use water sparingly. Transnet says that it's increased its revenue despite the weak economic conditions affecting volumes that it handled. The company says going forward it will be investing in measures and acquisition opportunities to expand Transnet services. It says while it does not believe South Africa will be downgraded, it has however begun negotiations with lenders to prepare for any eventualities. Animation, virtual reality and games. We have all of that and other technology and social media news. I've got the full version of the game at home, so, so I've, I play it a lot at home. We also tell you how Africans are using tech to improve their lives. We have to close the digital uh, gap. So join us on Network for your African technology and social media news. That's Network with Ms. Pumelele Zondi every Sunday at 7.30pm Central African Time. Water-wise, water is an essential need. The scarcity of it could lead to loss of many lives, including livestock, plants, and much more. It requires us to use it sparingly and responsibly in times of need, failing which our taps and sanitation will not function. For more on water and weather issues, stay tuned to News Today, every Friday at quarter to five, Central African time. SABC News, making you water-wise. Welcome back. We're talking childhood obesity with my special guest, Dr. Wendy Duncan, a child and adolescent psychiatrist based at the healthcare, Oxford Healthcare Centre in Shenzhen, Ria Katsikas, clinical dietitian and nutritional uh, consultant from Nutritional Solutions, also based in Shenzhen, and Sue Jones, health and nutrition program manager, Save the Children SA. Perhaps let's stay with you, Sue. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking just now in terms mm. of the impact that obesity has mm. on children. Just before we, we start talking about causes and those factors, yeah, from your perspective, yeah, what impact are you seeing? We're seeing a massive impact globally. I yeah. mean, it, in, let's talk about South Africa because it's a transitioning country. So we are still seeing children who are underweight, children with severe acute malnutrition. And then on the other side of the scale, we're looking at children who are becoming overweight and obese. Mm. So, and that really, if you look at the statistics, is actually overtaking the undernutrition mm. issues mm. in this country. Mm. So, and because of that, we're looking at you know, an increase in non-communicable diseases, as, right. as my colleagues were saying. Um, and I think you know, South Africa, is, it, it's so complicated in this country. We've had a, obviously a big issue with, with HIV. We've had a big issue with children dying of, of communicable diseases. Mm. We're going to be seeing you know, younger adults, um, middle-aged people now dying more of, of non-communicable diseases. Yeah, yeah. So life expectancy on one side has improved, but yeah. we might see it getting worse in the future I mean, because of these non-communicable diseases. Your example is the fact that diabetes is seen more and more in children, um, you know, uh, and, which is obviously a worrying trend. Now let's get back to causes and risk factors. Mm. Are there any genetic risk factors for childhood obesity? I mean, she, Ria, earlier, you know, alluded to the fact that uh, children are brought by, in fact, obese parents. Is there a genetic link? I mean, there certainly is. Mm. And, it, and with the advancement of science and the advancement of the genetic understanding of disease, I think they're coming into contact with more and more gene loci and chromosomal uh, abnormalities that, mm. 
suggest th that there's a heritable component. Mm -hmm. um, there are, of course, unusual situations where we've got uh, chromosomal abnormalities, and these are a rarity, mm -hmm. conditions like the Prader-Willi syndrome, yeah. uh, where there is a, already a pre-existing genetic uh, uh, vulnerability yeah. to obesity and overweight. Yeah. But uh, certainly in families, um, obese parents have obese children. Yeah. Um, but perhaps one might argue that it, it may not necessarily be genetic, but more, you know, mainly lifestyle kind of issues. Yeah. We often talk about the, the genes sort of loading the gun and the environment pulling the trigger. Right, right. And uh, so there's a genetic vulnerability that doesn't necessarily have to manifest itself yeah. should the environment uh, support uh, yeah. the child. All right, okay. So environmental factors now, lifestyle. You, you earlier suggested that perhaps it's more lifestyle and, you know, yeah. um, it's, in it's a family complex environment. And there's there's yeah. many factors that contribute. Right. Um, they did a, a study um, where they interviewed 8,000 households that was uh, representative of the demographics of South Africa. They called it the South African National Health and Nutrition Examination <laughs> Survey. And what they found was that Poverty, to a certain extent, is a risk factor that 34% of children don't have enough food in their houses. They don't eat breakfast, for example. They also found that 64% of parents identified cost as a fact, the main important factor when they buy food. Only 14% identified health as a factor they consider when they buy food. Lack of knowledge was identified mm -hmm. as, a, as a big factor. They, they did a study with the, with the children where they had to identify healthy foods. And the score they needed to reach was four. And only 0.9% of the children reached the score, where 72% of the children reached a score be, um, between one and two. Mm -hmm. And then there's the urbanization, as, yeah. as mm -hmm. um, Sue has mentioned, so the transition. That um, is that is an interesting one mm. because, and, and perhaps linking to the issue of the cost, we see that this problem, uh, you know, tends to affect low-income and middle-income, mm. you know, mm. countries such as Asia and, and, and mm. Africa, for instance. Why is that? Be because, you know, there are some people that might argue that, you know, uh, lower cost would probably get you food that's not necessarily unhealthy. Uh, that it's the more mm. processed foods that, in fact, are more expensive than the healthier foods. Your, your comment mm. on that? I think for me it's all about food choices as well. Yeah. And I think it's about the availability of the food. Yeah. And, uh, with, Save, with Save South Africa, I, I travel a lot, you know, through all the different communities. And every town I go to, there is fast food. Mm. And I think just the availability of that and the advertising of the fast food mm. is very influential. Yeah. And it's not, it's not that expensive. Right. So, so I think what, what we need to do, and I know we'll talk about this later, is, is really think about you know, what value can we get from the money that people earn in mm. terms of buying healthy food. Yeah. Can I Before, just yeah. also mention that they found with this particular study there's a positive correlation between working hours of mothers mm -hmm. and obese children yeah. linking up mm. to the fast foods. Mm. Yeah. And, and the, the unhealthy food, they are cheaper. Also what was interesting from this study was that although 60% of the adults were overweight and obese, their perception was that they thought they were not overweight. So there is, but what's very important, I think there is definitely a lack of knowledge, not in terms of food, but the importance of obesity as a health risk mm. for disease. Mm. Yeah. People don't realize that if you carry these abdominal fat that it can actually be... Okay. Mm. We're going to come back to... That they are at risk. Yeah. Some of those unhealthy mm. foods that you referred to, mm. perhaps, you know, practical examples. Mm. But, Dr. Duncan, let, let's just talk about, you know, this, this whole notion that, um, um, uh, I, I mean, clearly, nutrition on the one hand, mm. but physical activity, mm. you know. Uh, mm. Perhaps mm. let's try and track it from early childhood. Is there a problem? Mm. Are we st starting to see a bit of a problem there? Certainly, there's no doubt that we're seeing increasingly more sedentary lifestyles in right. our children. And this is across the socioeconomic spectrum. Mm. So with the increased availability of television, 
the cheaper access to devices and electronic uh, media, we're seeing children again making choices to be less and less active. Mm. And I think, uh, as has been indicated, as parents are more uh, needing to be in the marketplace and needing to be at work, yeah. um, there's less parental supervision of activities. Mm. And, and the choice is to, or the default is to go for the more sedentary activity. Yeah. So we, did, we didn't talk about breastfeeding. Mm. very early on. How, how important is that in the development of a childhood mm. obesity? It's extremely important. Mm. Right. I think across the board breastfeeding is important for, for health. Yeah. But in terms of um, obesity, there, there are <coughs> pardon me, positive associations in terms of a healthier habitus right. with breastfeeding. Right, right. Let's get back to those mm. unhealthy food choices that you referred to. What sort of examples have you got? You know, uh, just to sort of mention maybe the, the very the, um, small child, they did find very important that early, also early introduction, too early introduction of solid foods, mm -hmm. energy dense food, yeah. contribute to obesity. And what we encourage now mothers to do is to breastfeed breast uh, feed exclusively mm -hmm. until six months mm -hmm. and then to start to introduce solid foods. What we, about sugary foods? What happened now with the small children is instead of water, often they get uh, rooibos tea with sugar, mm. they get diluted condensed milk, uh, often cremora or uh, creamers, they get diluted fruit juice instead of water. And if we look at older children in terms of the food, it's, it's soft drinks I have identified as a particular food item that definitely contribute to obesity as one tin of soft drinks contains yeah. seven teaspoons of sugar. Mm. Quick fix solutions, uh, I imagine. All right. Maybe on this note, let's take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we now get practical and say, what can we do to try and prevent this problem, starting with early childhood? Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill, we'll help you stay well. MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. Failure to implement the water restriction is going to make the system not workable. For the domestic use, everyone should not exceed 25 kiloliters per day. What is the penalty and, and how much have you raked in thus far as a municipality? For domestic users, if they uh, exceed 25 kiloliters, then they're going to be charged a penalty on their monthly bill. And so far already we've collected 1.7 million. The 200 million rand state-of-the-art school in Mahalisburg had been vandalized by drug addicts. How bad is it? It's very bad. In today, hostel residents, it was even worse mm. because uh, there the doors, the wardrobes, the beds, the ceiling were broken down. Showers were ripped off and uh, it couldn't be used by, by, by students uh, who are actually using uh, that particular boarding facility. Yeah. Welcome back. We're talking childhood obesity and with me is uh, three special guests, Dr. Wendy Duncan, child and adolescent psychiatrist based in Santon at the Oxford Healthcare Centre, uh, Ria Katikas, dietitian from Nutritional Solutions, also based in Santon, and uh, Sue Jones, uh, health and uh, nutrition program manager, Save the Children SA. Now, obviously we've laid out mm the story now around you know what actually causes or what are the risk mm. factors now let's try and help people that are watching out there to say all right mm. let's come practical solutions and let's start early early on mm. we mentioned a little bit the importance of breastfeeding perhaps mm. just to re-emphasize yeah certainly i think um 
and it revolves, I think, around education. Right. So it starts prenatally. I think it starts when uh, the young mother falls pregnant. Mm. Uh, that education should be given around uh, healthy nutrition during pregnancy, mm. around breastfeeding once uh, the infant is born, um, around reduction of stress. There's some evidence to show that um, stress and the, the abnormal metabolism of fats and sugars mm. starts in utero. Mm. Um, so these are vital things mm. in our country, which is particularly stressed. Okay, so mm -hmm. we mentioned the importance of you know, family setup and lifestyle mm. there. Uh, an opportunity perhaps to educate the mm. parents, uh, you know, adults, in terms of these risk factors, mm. yeah, your view on that? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think, I think that, you know, especially for the younger children, that's mm -hmm. where the education needs to be with the caregivers, right. with the parents. Right. Um, I mean, there's, there's I, I guess the, the way to prevent obesity is an overweight is multifactorial. Right. So it's not just about getting the parents and the caregivers involved, it's really about the whole community. Yeah. We have to really, you know, increase the awareness of what is good and optimal nutrition. Yeah for the community, you know, from, from birth. We've actually, in South Africa, we've just had the World Breastfeeding Conference. Yeah. So it's excellent timing for talking about breastfeeding and the importance of breastfeeding because, yeah. you know, as Wendy said, it reduces, you know, the risk of obesity. So yeah. that's, that's really important. But at the same time, breastfeeding itself is very, very difficult and it needs a lot of support. Yeah. So really one of the key messages that came from the conference was, we have to give mothers that support when they leave the facility. Yeah. And then that would help in the whole multifactorial process of reducing obesity. Yeah, perhaps let's get practical in terms of, you know, I mean, you do get, especially in the you know, major towns and cities, um, working mums, you know, that have young babies. Uh, practically, what can they do to ensure that nutrition is optimal for the baby? See, we, we talk about responsive feeding and what the research tells us that mothers often decide how much children should eat and what the research tells us is that parents are responsible to provide a variety of healthy unprocessed food to children. Yeah. They don't actually need to buy special mm. baby food. Mm. They need to eat the food that the family eats, that's healthy food, um, mashed up. Um, working mothers can freeze and that comes all with, with education and there's a window period from six months to a year where small children are quite responsive to different tastes and textures mm. and you need to introduce as much variety of foods, mashed poultries, yeah. wild brown rice. Yeah. They don't have to eat bottled food, processed mm. foods yeah. and then um, leave it to the children to decide how much they want and um, not force feed mm. and be aware and be educated in terms of portions that's appropriate for the children's age. Ella, you mm. mentioned sweetened drinks and rooibos putting mm. sugar. So, so, yeah. so, so what are you saying? People shouldn't be putting sugar in rooibos tea? No, they should not be putting sugar in rooibos tea. Right. We all get born with an innate taste for sweetness and often what happens, it's, it's practical that children are crying and we all probably guilty that we try to comfort the children mm. with food. We reward children with food. Yeah. And when we taste something sweet, it's nice. But um, what's happening as a children from a very small age, the amount of sugar that um, they then consume is far more than what they should consume from a yeah. health point of view. Yeah. Supermarkets. There was discussion around mm. the issue, you know, <laughs> about supermarkets. Uh, I think somebody mm. described this country as diabetogenic or something, yeah. you know, that okay. uh, if you walk around the aisles of a supermarket, there's all sorts of sweets laid out there. And if you're mm. w walking around with children, uh, I mean, it says basically, yeah, grab, grab, grab me. Um, and there was a suggestion that perhaps these should be banned. In fact, one of the major chain stores had announced that, in fact, they'll be removing these sweets from their eyes, but obviously mm. we don't see that. Your view on that? Mm. I personally, I don't think that sweets should be removed 100%. Right. You know, I, I think as part of an overall balanced diet, yeah. as a s very small part of that, I, I don't see a problem. Mm. I think the issue that you're talking about is that in supermarkets, these s sweet stalls tend to be where you are exiting and yes. waiting in the queue, yes. for me that's the issue because then, you know, even the parent will be tempted. 
So of course the child is. The child has to wait in a queue. It's boring. Yeah. So they're nagging the parent. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, if, if that was one big change that could make them, that, that wasn't there, perhaps put healthy, healthy food, healthy snacks. Mm. That would encourage people. Let's talk about early childhood. Um, yeah, we can talk nutrition, but in terms also in terms of physical activity. Somebody argued that, you know, if you introduce physical activity from as early as, you know, eight months, mm. For, mm. you know, around a year, <coughs> that, that will have huge benefits in future. Your, your view on that? Certainly. Um, children, by their very nature, are going to be on the move. Um, they're going to be crawling, they're going to be wanting to explore, they're going to be wanting to, to run and get going. Mm. And, and what this would involve is the participation of the caregivers, mm. be it the parents, be it the uh, um, crash teacher, nursery school teacher, climbing, running, jumping. Mm. That's what children are naturally inclined to want to do. It's when there is reduced participation I think of, of parents and caregivers, yeah. their children get put in front of a device as a parenting tool, mm. and then we run into trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Children starting school, in terms of the food that they get exposed to at school, perhaps at home is one thing. I think we've spent quite mm. a bit of time talking about mm. food at home. Mm. Let's talk about away from home now. There was a study school. done in the Western Cape where they um, actually interviewed a hundred uh, schools, they called it a health kick study, and they found that the, t the two most popular items that get sold by uh, at tuck shops was potato crisps and sweets and soft drinks, were the mm -hmm. three most popular items. They also found that in the, in the study they talked about the whole environment that children are exposed to is that 50% of the schools had advertisements of Coca-Cola. So when you're looking at schools, it is a uh, it, it is a huge effort. It has to come from the principal, mm. where the, peer, the, the teachers need to start eating healthy. They need to change the duck shops completely yeah. to get mothers to actually probably cook proper food for the children. They need to go as far to look at the vendors because they need to make a living and they sell fed cook and bunny chows and all those um, fast foods just um, next to the school ground. So they need to become part of the solution and a whole school and there, w there are uh, some private initiatives that have sh shown to be very successful if everyone comes on board and there need to be a whole culture attitude that need to change yeah. towards everyone eating healthy mm. from the principal to the lady who cook yeah. and the schools are found in the community can in the community can do wonderful work bringing parents in, in terms of mm. um, hosting talks to parents of healthy eating, to do cooking demonstrations to mothers in terms of what to, to do if you if you time is limited and how to feed the family healthy. Yeah. This is indeed a serious problem. I think we, we need to uh, continue discussion on this, but that after the break. So after the break, we'll continue our discussion on prevention of obesity, uh, this time around older children and adolescents. Please stay with us. Embracing our members in good health since 1968. If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. They may be associated problem with the arteries of the heart in patients with hypertensive heart disease, and in some instances, it's just pure the muscle disease problem. The statistics show us that half the population of individuals with high blood pressure are not even aware that they've got high blood pressure. There's the amount of salt we eat because there's a big uh, influence on our blood pressure levels. So using less salt when you're cooking, you, less salty spices when you're cooking, not adding salt to the table, but rather using other spices and herbs to flavor your food. And then of course how much sugar you eat is also very important. If you start becoming um, uncomfortable or where you feel that your effort tolerance is becoming less, mm. you can't lie flat, you run short of breath, you start swelling in the legs and so on. It's high time that one should consult a doctor. Join Health Talk every Saturday for all your health news.
keeping you up to date with business development. There's no shortage of money in the system. There's a shortage of implementation capacity uh, to actually get things done. Always on point with news of the day. May has promised radical social and economic reforms, fueling speculation over the future of current senior figures. On the ball every time with all sports codes. The Joburg side already have a quarter final at home, and a victory against the Argentines will ensure home semi final. Accurate weather updates after every bulletin. Stay tuned to News Today at 3 p.m. from Monday to Friday on SABC News. The Kalahari Transportier Park is a large wildlife preserve and conservation area in southern Africa. Kalahari means place of thirst. The total area is 38,000 square kilometers. Approximately three quarters of the park lie in Botswana and one quarter in South Africa. South Africa embraced the concept of transporteers linking ecological reserves across national borders. On the 12th of May 2000, President Festus Mukhaye of Botswana and Tabombeki of South Africa formally launched South Africa's first peace park. It has 200 species of birds, including vultures, mammalians such as black Kalahari lions and large heads of herbivores, namely earlands, springboks, blue velvetpiers, and more. Welcome back. So let's talk more about, you know, prevention of childhood obesity. My three special guests, Dr. Wendy Duncan, child, child and adolescent psychiatrist based at the Oxford Healthcare Center in Saxonwold. Ria Katsikas, dietitian uh, from Nutritional Solutions in Santon. And um, Shu Jones, health and nutrition program manager, Save the Children SA. Let's start with you. I know that you've got some samples that you're going to show us, but a bit later, but yeah, okay. yeah as, as you get them. <laughs> Sue, she mentioned the issue of, um, you know, tuck shops mm. and so on, that perhaps, you know, there should be some way mm. that we can force the schools, um, you know, to, to serve, obviously, more healthier mm. foodstuffs mm. in there. Mm. But the reality is that in some schools, uh, okay, we're not bashing Coca-Cola necessarily, but mm -hmm. the example that was mentioned is that, uh, you know, schools don't have funding and, and you know, they, they, they get sponsorships, you know, for Coca-Cola or any other company for that matter to have a sign out there. It means that, you know, they mm. put in a little bit of money in there to help the school on other matters. Mm. So it, uh, I, would, I would imagine it, you know, it's understandable that you'd find some of these mm. products there. So do you mm. think should, you know, this should be regulated? Food should, food, schools should be forced into changing what they serve children? I, I, don't think, I don't think they should be forced. Perhaps that's, that's too strong a word. But right. I, I think that the policies should be enforced. Right. The Department of Education has a national schools nutrition program. Right. And that, that has you know, various parts to it. For example, they provide, schools for the, sorry, they provide food for the low-income schools. But there's also health education mm. that goes through the life skills curriculum. Um, there should also be you know, an improvement in physical activity. Mm. So I, I think the key really is to enforce the policies, yeah. to work very closely with the people who, who govern the schools, so the school governing bodies, the school management teams. Educate them. Educate them more. Provide more information about you know, what, what could potentially be the outcome if Coca-Cola are advertising outside the school. Yeah. So I think that would be the, probably the better way to do it. Interesting. You have views on that? I agree completely, mm -hmm. and I think the the next step uh, beyond the nutrition is the physical activity, right. is having spaces for children to play, right. mm -hmm. having spaces for children to run mm -hmm. in, okay. uh, jungle gyms, uh, sports curriculums, okay. and and accessing funding around that so that yeah. those uh, uh, activities and opportunities can be provided to children. 
encouraging sports participation by everybody mm, at school. Yeah. All right, Ria, um, one of the clips that we played earlier showed you know, the whole problem around putting together a proper lunch box for your child and you know, at the same time giving the child a little bit of money okay, when they go to school. With the money, obviously, they buy all sorts of stuff. Your advice to parents in terms of what they should package in a lunchbox? My advice to parents is to first of all provide children with a good breakfast that consists of fruit and whole grain cereals. Okay, that lay the foundation of the day. And then in the lunchbox, it depends on the time that the child spends at school. It should be um, consist of a lean protein, yeah. such as boiled eggs, pulchets, that can be combined with whole grains such as wild brown rice, yeah. unrefined you maize. Have, you have some samples to show um, us. Seed yeah. bread. What I've done here is I actually just contrast two lunch boxes. Mm -hmm. um, nutrition is complex and it's, it's a lot of education that needs to take place. Um, but this particular lunch box, one, um, it's contained um, poloni with brown bread, viennas, and then a yogurt drink that often people perceive as this quite healthy. This appears to be the most popular one. Yes, it? but it contained 40 grams sugar. That is mm. 8 teaspoons of sugar. And I analyzed this particular lunchbox just to show that the energy for this small lunchbox, and often people get quite a lot of food, is over 3,460 kilojoules. It contained very little fiber, 2 gram fiber, 30 gram fat, and 40 gram of sugar. And then I had the healthy lunchbox that sort of represent what every single health organization in the world tell us, from the American Heart Association to the um, World Health Organization, that we should all eat five portions of fruit and veggies a day. So I used a health seed bread that contained more, far more fiber and veggies and fruit. And if you look at this particular lunchbox, the, although more food, um, it's, it's low in energy. Mm. It's... 10 gram of fiber compared to two, only nine gram of fat and zero sugar. Just a and I looked only here at like few nutrients, but, but this particular lunchbox have far more uh, micronutrients, vitamins yeah. and minerals. That's absolutely essential for all children's health compared to this particular lunchbox that we called is very nutrient poor. Apart from the high calorie fat and sugar content, yeah. it, it provided the child with no nutrients. I'll come back to the issue of cost and taste to the, and preference mm. to, the, to the kids. But you wanted to say something. I think it's really important as well to consider the psychology of the child and right. what's considered to be cool. Yeah. Mm. And, and this is where the education that comes in right from the get-go is, is really important. Yeah. Because what's considered to be cool is to have tuck shop money, to have the processed food, yes. and to have the, the quick fix. Yeah. So I think that's something important to bear well, in mind. Talk about tuck shop money. I mean, the practical, the reality perhaps, is that uh, a child takes to school a healthy lunchbox mm. and has some tuck shop money. What happens? That mm. lunch box come, comes back as it is. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, the child chooses then to go buy whatever stuff at the stock shop. Yeah? It comes down to education and how people consider healthy eating. Yeah. And um, I call it treats and, and pleasure foods, as mentioned, is part of healthy eating. Mm. But people are eating it daily. Mm. It's not a treat anymore. It's not an exception mm. anymore. It is the norm. And that is the, why children are so obese today, because these foods have become uh, supposed to be a treat, the occasional uh, packet of chips and sweets that we eat. Mm. Children eat it daily, and it replaces the healthy food. Mm. And that's the obesity crisis we're sitting with. Yeah. And parents are eating these foods on a daily basis, mm. and it replaces the healthy food. Mm. And they consider that also as not too bad. This is quite a complex problem. So, complex. so it's parents... It is the teachers, mm. it is the peers at school, yeah. it is the environment, you know, in terms of the tuck mm. shop, what's available at the tuck shop and so on. By the way, just in terms of cost of putting together mm. that healthy lunch box as, a, as compared to lunch box number one. I didn't, in this particular case, um, did the costing, but I has done costings before yeah. of meals. And always the, if you, if you buy fruits and vegetables in season, they are actually cheaper than the processed foods. Mm. 
I've looked at a meal once where, where uh, um, soft drinks was involved and processed foods uh, like these uh, processed meats, they are actually more expensive than the fruit and vegetables in season. Mm -hmm. Pulchets are quite, quite a cheap mm. star food, mm. Lucky Star yeah. is a star food. Yeah. It is actually cheaper than the processed meats. Yeah. I need to come back to that issue of, you know, the, the, the psychology mm. aspect of the kid. Just, just expand on it a bit to say, you know, how, how do you get the kid in a practical sense to, to kind of say, to understand that it's, it may not necessarily be cool mm. to want to eat what your friend is eating? I suppose at the end of the day, it, it has to be something that's introduced from the get-go. Mm. Um, there are, and I think particularly in South Africa, perceptions about prosper, uh, prosperity, you know, and the, the yogurt which is branded is considered to be uh, cool and associated with prosperity and, mm. and, and wealth. So uh, there will always be playground dynamics and there will always be power dynamics on the playground, mm. but it really is about uh, right from the get-go, getting yeah. children to appreciate what is, what is better for them. Yeah. Well, ladies, un unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. I think this has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, viewers out there have learned quite a lot, as much as I have. And uh, this has been Dr. Wendy Duncan, child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, based in uh, Oxford Healthcare Centre in Sandton. Uh, Ria Katikas, dietitian, nutritional solutions, based in Sandton. And Sue Jones, uh, health and nutrition program manager, Save the Children SA. Ladies, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank right. you very much. Thank well, it's on that note that we come to the end of our show today, folks. Uh, join us again next week on SABC News. And reminder to please share your views and comments with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. And yes, send us those tweets at Twitter at SABC Health Talk. You can watch repeats of this show as you always can from um, every Thursday morning at 5 a.m. And of course, Saturday at 2 p.m. I'm Dr. Salam Dung. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, sorry man. Shield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill, we'll help you stay well. MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. MedShield, embracing our members in good health since 1968. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. Give me that paperwork! Where is your paperwork? Give me that paperwork! Where is your paperwork? I don't know what's going on. Suddenly I'm locked up. This is not fair, Santa Bosizan. Not fair. We could put it in the two hundred. I just put like a two hundred. We run one. We one. One fifty, one fifty plus. No, no. Let me give me another one. One fifty. I'm just the one to lock you out. Yes, I'm the one to lock you then out. We are starting gangsterism. No. 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 Water wise. Water is an essential need. The scarcity of it could lead to loss of many lives, including livestock, plants, and much more. It requires us to use it sparingly and responsibly in times of need, failing which our taps and sanitation will not function. For more on water and weather issues, stay tuned to News Today, every Friday at quarter to five Central African time. SABC News, making you water wise.